Please be seated. I welcome each of you to this Thanksgiving service in celebration of the life of Ruth Jordan. We also welcome family members in different parts of the world who will be watching this service electronically. Um, that's seven different locations across the world. And we think particularly of Ruth's brother Tony in Australia and brother Peter in America. In St. John chapter 11, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live, even though he dies. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. And those words set the context of this service today. <coughs> we gather in the presence of God, who is the resurrection and the life, and whose promise of eternity has now been fulfilled for Ruth. And as we give thanks to God for Ruth's life as wife, mother, sister, friend, and child of God, we do it in the assurance that she is now with her Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. But at the same time, we don't want to minimise the feelings of sorrow we feel when someone we love is no longer with us. So we acknowledge the deep sense of loss that we feel. Watch and support and pray for Rob as he mourns the loss of his wife. And Kate, she mourns the loss of her mom. And we pray that this service might be a fitting tribute to Ruth's life and will bring a measure of comfort and a measure of strength to all. And actually to each person who is affected in any way by Ruth's promotion to glory. How a privilege to have been asked actually by Ruth herself to conduct this service. And when she knew that she didn't have long to live, she started to make arrangements for today. And it was her desire that this service should glorify God, not Ruth Dalton. Well, we want to do that, as well as allowing her family and friends the opportunity to share their memories of Ruth. During the past a couple of months she was determined to live each remaining day to her fullest potential. Her, height, her faith was heightened even further than it was before. She had no doubts as to the love and the grace of God who would soon welcome her into his heavenly heaven. The first song that we're going to sing talks about the assurance of our home for those who trust in God. <laughs> And the final four lines sum up something of Ruth's faith, where it says, My hope I cannot measure, my heart to life is free, my Saviour has my treasure, and he will walk with me. Shall we stand together as we sing? <laughs>
and so many of us have been privileged to share different parts of Ruth's life. And we will give testimony to her Christian character and her impact on our lives. But those who knew her best, Rob and Kate, we're going to listen to some of their personal memories of Ruth. And Angela is going to read them for us. And I think that's some of her own memories as well. And this is going to be followed by a powerful recording of Ruth herself speaking about a new day. Thank you, Angela. <coughs> Ruth often said that she missed teaching, 
watching the town and children grow. Ruth recently met with some of her, the ladies that she went to college with just 43 years ago. And again, she expressed the feeling she had when she left the classroom for the last time to take up a head teacher's position. And they reminisced about their activities in teaching. And it was obvious they were all dedicated teachers and all remembered the joy they had worked in their different roles in the education. When her sang, she could never stand still. She would engage with her audience and invite them into the world of God's love with every gesture and nuance of her voice. She sang her last solo at Peter and Stell's retirement, and even there took her message directly to the audience that included more than a few majors, colonels, and even a general. During 2015, Ruth finally convinced herself and a few people around her that the fellowship plan was to be started. From the early days of the fellowship band, Ruth was convinced and convicted that the need for such a choir, where the fellowship she experienced in the band would be carried over to this new enterprise. And, as Ruth never missed an opportunity to invite people to the choir, I do so now. The next rehearsal is Pill Salvation Army, 7.30, on Monday the 22nd of February. See you all there. When Kate returned home from university, she brought home Nan. And from that time on, Nan matter being with his son, whom she loved as much as any son could be loved. Matt has taken his place in Ruth's family and has been an integral part of her support over these years and supported us all in these times. So Rob and Ruth, no, Rob and Kate, sorry, have invited me to say something personal about my friend and I'd like to do that at this point and then leave you with Robert's final words. I first became friends with Ruth when Stuart and I moved to Bristol. Ruth had come for a meal bring me to Sox's and then drop me home as she travelled through the church. The friendship developed over the years. We had children within a couple of months of one another and our children became firm friends and still are. I soon realised that everything we did was underpinned with prayer. So it was not surprising that a few years ago, the three of us, Sue Alcock, Ruth and I, but God telling us that we should re-establish the prayer room here at Easton, and we did. And we often went there for prayer. But I think our friendship really deepened two years ago, and a friendship deepened with Rob too. With everything that has happened to Ruth over these past two years, there has been an awful lot of laughter. I never heard her say, why me? Or feel sorry for herself. Instead, it gave Ruth an even deeper faith in the presence of the Holy Spirit within her. Ruth knew where she was going and was not afraid. In fact, this is what she told an unsuspecting skier on a ski bus going back to the hotel in November. She had engaged this man who spoke little English in conversation and, asked, and he asked if she would be back next year. With sign language, Ruth informed him that she wouldn't be here, that she knew where she was going. And in the next breath, in only the way that Ruth could do it, with a point of the finger, she said, do you know God? <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't know the man's reply, as we had arrived at the best spot and skiers were getting on with us. But Ruth was always ready to challenge those she met, and me too, about faith. Ruth's influence was infectious, as only a few hours before she died, I was telling the checkout girl in Tesco about going to visit my friend who was ill. I heard myself going into a lot of detail about how strong my friend's faith was, and how she would challenge anybody about their faith, and she was not afraid of where she was going to go. But the girl did ask me what I was going to do for the rest of the day. And to turn to Robert's words. Ruth's health issues have been over an extended time from 2014, when, her brain, when she had her brain injury. And at this time, Kate and I would like to thank you all 
for the interest and the help you gave us during this time when Ruth was recovering and during her subsequent rehabilitation. As has been said before, we have lost an active follower of Christ. Who will take the place? So that was Ruth. And we have a new day to look forward to. She wants us to use it wisely and to continue to follow Christ. Let me listen to Ruth speak about a new day. And beautiful time of the day. So wake up with a smile on your face and make the most of this morning. Be grateful for the new day. Take a deep breath and relax. Enjoy your coffee. A new day is a chance to refuel your soul. It's really nice to wake up in the morning realizing that God has given you another day to live. May God give us relief for every stress, a sweet song for every sigh, an answer for every prayer, and peace for every troubled moment. A blessed day today. Don't wait for someone to bring you flowers. Plant your own garden and decorate your own soul. Every day may not be good, but there's something good in every day. When God gives you a new beginning, it starts with a ending. Be thankful for closed doors. They often guide us to the right door. If you're thankful for what you have, you will end up having more. Don't start your day with broken pieces of yesterday. Today is a new day, a day to start afresh. Every day starts with some expectation, but every day ends with some experience. Hope your day begins with love and ends with beautiful memories. Every new day is another chance to change your life. Make the most of this day. Laugh, love, dream. Live every moment. Every morning starts a new page in your story. Make it to a great one today. <coughs> a challenge to all of us. We face our new days. That you're aware of God and of His presence. And faith is such an integral part of who Ruth was and everything that she did. Singing is an integral part of her life, as we've heard. Um, so much so that when a group of the songsters went to sing to her in the hospital following her brain injury, when she couldn't remember much at all about the past, she was able to sing the music and the words, which just came so easily. 
and so naturally it's in there. And the senses are going to sing for us just now. A solo testimony, which again highlights Ruth's experience of Jesus. This is why I love my Jesus. <laughs>
tone of Ruth's calling and <coughs> love of teaching, I've been invited to Reverend Brian Pierce to bring his own personal memories of Ruth. Uh, Brian was the Chair of Governors at Dr. Bell's and St. Matthias School. And um, after Brian's brought his tribute, so maybe is going to bring us the scripture reading. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> <coughs> Can I start by thanking God for the words of wisdom from Ruth? Wonderful. I should like to copy those kind of words. I come from the days of Dr. Bell's and St. Matthias Church of England voluntary aid school. I remember well him sitting in the, in the conference with the governors trying to think out a new name for the new school. This is the only one we came up with. But thank you, Rob, for the opportunity to come and pay tribute to Bruce and thank God for a ministry at that new amalgamated school. Oh, what a difference you made. And I thank God that I would chair the governing body that had the wisdom and the insight, the inspiration and the guidance to make that appointment. That's Ruth. Smile, looking directly into your eyes and engulfing you with the love of God. She exuded love. But she could also put you in your place. <laughs> she spoke directly, truthfully, and there was no doubt in your own mind where you stood, and where she stood, and where we both stood with God. That was Ruth. And that was Ruth who filled our school with a sense of purpose and a sense of pride. Rob said to me, as I thought of what I was going to say, that Ruth had shared that she didn't simply want to listen to things she had done. And I said there was no fear of that because my memory didn't take good. <laughs> this is ten years ago. So Ruth, I'm going to show you that there is not going to be a list of the things you have done. But I think behind this remarkable Ruth is a very important aspect of Ruth's faith and attitude to life. You see that anything that Ruth put and applied her mind to in life was never just a job or things to be done or things to get done. Life was a vocation from God in service and love of Him and those who He called her to serve. With all her gifts, especially in teaching, and yes, also in being a wife to Rob, a mother and mother-in-law to Jacob, and Matt, and sister. There she was to fulfill her vocation to God and those she embraced in love. Underlying Ruth's maxim in life, I think, is St. Paul's injunction. Let everyone lead the life which the Lord has assigned them and in which God has called them. Or to paraphrase it, walk worthily in the vocation to which you have been called, using the gifts that God has given you. Thus, when we interviewed Ruth for the role of head of a newly amalgamated primary school, Ruth had come, as no doubt in others, with a vocation for the new school from her previous experiences and acquired gifts. I remember when Ruth toured the new building to, our distraught, uh, to, to the distraught of those who had designed it and the governors, she had a number of suggestions regarding what was being put into place. From the point of view that this was not simply a building to contain children, and students but a place of learning. I think it was her observation um, to our horror when looking at the new octagonal infant school saying that it would be useless for assemblies due to a very resounding echo in the building. 
This led to the further expenses by uh, installing acoustic balls to deaden the echo, and I think they're probably still there now. Ruth was a visionary. Seeing that teaching was about children, realizing their full potential in all aspects of body, mind, and spirit, and to open their minds to their spiritual potential and God at work in every aspect of their lives. In this, she clearly saw the place of us, Roger and I, the supporting clergy of the parish churches of the saints and St. Mary's, involved and encouraged, if that was needed, and requested that we met with her every Monday morning before school for prayer and sharing thoughts and concerns that she needed to share, and no doubt we did to share with her. Rob had already mentioned the tour we did at the school, praying for God's blessing and guidance in all the classrooms and places of teaching. With what you did sense. And that was typical of Ruth. <coughs> for Ruth, developing a child's potential was also about children being accountable for their attitudes and treatment towards others. <coughs> We often saw this in our encounters with children, especially where discipline had to be applied, and also with their parents, whom she had to interview often. A certain 19th century educationalist, John Bosco, said, about ahead of his time, as far as possible, avoid punishing. Try to gain love before inspiring fear. There's something of Ruth in that. Ruth's dedication and willingness to put everything and her whole self into her role was demonstrated very clearly right at the beginning, where before she could move into or use the new school, she had to endure working for what amounted to a large storeroom, using only her mobile, which she had on the phone, often through the window to get a signal, to order materials and equipment for the new school, to deal with all the administrative requirements and demands and appointments. I all said salvation began in a stable, the birth of the Melbourne school began in a store. <laughs> Later, when the new school was in being, there were two incidents which again indicated and showed and demonstrated Ruth's commitment. The security alarm system broke down, which meant the school was vulnerable until an engineer could find and put it right, which meant that Ruth, who was wrong, and I spent the early hours of the morning waiting for an engineer to come and put the, uh, put the alarm system right before she would go home. And that happened twice. And on the second time, Rob had to come from his place of work, I think we're in Bath or something. Oh, crying! <laughs> <laughs> Only to find when he got there, and the engineer arrived, it also got from crying as well. <laughs> such is life. <coughs> and such, would say Ruth, is one of those things. Ruth has truly walked, working in the vocation to which God has called her, and in leaving her post to continue in her vocation in retirement. And in so doing, she left the legacy of a school that had at its heart the love of God and service of each other in heart and mind, soul and strength. With a postscript, Rob told me that on the Sunday before she died, she was found worshipping in a place alongside the Constable Solstice. Vocation continued for Ruth and for us, right up to and being received into glory.
Thank you, Reverend. God bless you. Paul writes to the church at Corinth and he says this, I tell you this, brothers and sisters, flesh and blood cannot have a part in the kingdom of God. Something that will ruin cannot have a part in something that never ruins. But look, I tell you this secret. We will not all sleep in death, but we will all be changed. It will take only a second, as quickly as the eye blinks, when the last trumpet sounds. <coughs> the trumpet will sound, and those who have died will be raised to live forever, and we will all be changed. This body that can never be destroyed must clothe itself with something that can never be destroyed. And this body that dies must clothe itself with something that can never die. So this body that can be destroyed will clothe itself with that which can never be destroyed. And this body that dies will clothe itself with that which can never die. When this happens, this scripture will be made true. Death is destroyed forever in victory. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your pain? Death's power to hurt is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But we thank God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then Paul finishes with these words. He could be stood here this morning saying these words. So, my dear brothers and sisters, stand strong. Do not let anything change you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your work in the Lord is never wasted. Amen. Ruth Lillian Clark was the youngest child and only daughter of Salvation Army officers. Um, Edward and Kathleen Clark, known to uh, many of us. Right from an early age, Ruth was introduced to the things of God. And we know she came to experience faith in Jesus for herself. In, she had such a burden, really, to live out her Christian faith in such a way that she encouraged spiritual development in others. 1977, Ruth married Robert Dalton, and a little later, Kate came along. <coughs> and I'm very grateful to Rob for letting me have a copy of a testimony that Ruth gave a number of years ago. And in it, she said that her Christianity could not be just for Sundays or with a certain group of friends. It had to be evident at work and at home. Ruth is very much an integral part of this corps. Being corps sergeant major for a time, and solster sergeant, and um, I think assistant YPSN, I think, so, somewhere along the way. And I actually remember as a, a young lieutenant, um, Ruth asked me once when I came home for some ideas uh, for youth fellowship. So maybe somewhere along the line there was some activity with the young people there. But even in retirement, Ruth wanted to continue to serve the community. And she did this in a variety of ways, uh, including volunteering at Western Hospital in the chaplaincy team, being on the rota, I think, here for the, the homeless drop-in, and the winter walk rota at Western Corps. She was an active member of the Rotary Club of Western Supermare. And even after her brain injury, she took part in charity collections uh, I think on a motorised scooter. She always wanted to do what she could to help others. We know the last few years have not been easy for Ruth and her family. Her life was different. 
and she knew that she could never go back to the way things were. But she came to that point where she was determined to live her life <coughs> to the full. And the one thing that has never wavered is her belief in God and her trust in Jesus. In fact, she became more firm <coughs> in her testimony and her desire that other people should know her Lord. She was never afraid to talk of his power and his strength, and she was not afraid to leave this world, to spend eternity in his presence. The passage that David read from us from 1 Corinthians 15 gives the Christian view of death. It is not the end, but the beginning of a life lived in the actual presence of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul is concluding his glorious discord on the resurrection. And these closing verses, like a, a climatic song of victory, a kind of symphony in three movements. The first tells us that we will be transformed, that we will receive a heavenly body that enables us to live with God. We will be changed instantly. A little boy asked his mother what death was like. She said to him, Do you remember when you fell asleep in the living room? Your father picked you up in his big, strong arms and took you to your bedroom. When you woke up, you found yourself in another room. Death for the Christian is like that. You go to sleep in one room and wake up in another. Thus, we do not need to ever fear death whether we sleep or take part in the rapture. We have supreme confidence that we will be with Christ. Secondly, sin will no longer exist. Revelation tells us that when we leave this earth and go to be with Christ in his glory, it's a place where there's no more pain or sin, no more suffering or sorrow, but only the joy and the worship of our Lord. Death indeed is swallowed up in victory. It no longer has any sting for us because Christ has already won the victory. He has brought us salvation by his death on the cross and his resurrection <coughs> guarantees there is life after death. And thirdly, there is us who are left. We are urged to stand firm in our faith, to keep on working for the Lord, knowing that whatever we do for the Lord is never wasted. I can think of no better tribute to this than for us to fully trust in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour, and to keep on working for the Lord, to let nothing move us away from our faith, and to live in such a way that others will be influenced for God. If we truly believe Christ has won the victory over death and sin, that fact must affect the way we live right now and into the future. Today, we salute with Dalton, a true soldier of Jesus Christ. We say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We turn to our final song, very beautiful words that I'm sure we know very well. The King of Love, my Shepherds. Before we actually sing, just a very practical note, um, if you're going to the crematorium after this service, please remember to take your service sheets with you. Um, but if you're not going to the crown, you're very welcome to stay here and tea and coffee will be available in the community room. Shall we stand together as we say, the King of love, my shepherd is, whose goodness faileth not, I nothing lack if I am his, and he is mine forever. <laughs>
Beloved Heavenly Father, we give thanks for the life and the faith of Ruth Dalton. We, we give thanks for the influence that she's had on each of our lives <coughs> and the way that she always sought to see the good and sought to encourage. And Lord, we just pray for Robert and Kate, for Tony, David, Peter, and Matt, and the rest of the extended family. We pray, Lord, that they will have that deep assurance of knowing that Ruth is with you, and that deep assurance in their own lives that they are also your children. So be with us, Lord, as we take root from this call to a final resting place. In Jesus' name, we ask it. Amen. Amen. Amen.